Hello, my friends. This is episode 280 of Stand Up. Joining me on today's episode, comedian Christian Finnegan, finance and investment expert Barry Ritholtz, and comedian and activist Liz Winstead. Not in that order. I'm Pete Dominic. Time to stand up with me right now. Late on Thursday night, Cabaracha from the shed in a great mood after hanging out with over 50 listener and subscribers to this show. And real happy to have Liz Winstead stop by our Zoom hangout last night, as well as JL Covan popped in because he's actually a supporter and subscriber of the show himself. So he always knows when we're meeting, which, by the way, is every Thursday at 8 p.m. East. Unless otherwise, the link is in every day's email, which you also get as a stand up community member. So sign up right now. Go to Patreon dot com slash Pete Dominic or click on the paid subscription link. In the show notes, thanks very much for joining me today. Usually I do the news segment up front, a big, robusty, fat, thoughtful, juicy news segment filled with information and jokes and rants. But this week I'm taking that off to give myself more time and I really haven't gotten much done. And it's not because I've been screwing around, it's just (laughs) I still... Just trying to catch up and keep up, not complaining. I'm trying to figure out my workflow, my efficiency, but running this podcast on my own means it's just uh, tough to balance everything, and uh, I just can't bring someone someone else on until we get more subscribers. But I'm very excited with where I'm at. Over 800 paying subscribers. Got to get to at least 3,000, I think, before we can bring on someone full-time to help produce and edit, but... I'm loving it. I'm loving doing it. So thank you very much for supporting me to do it. Great conversations with all of my guests today here at the end of another crazy week in America where we're trying to vaccinate a million people. We're trying to figure out these new variants of the coronavirus. We're trying to understand what is happening in our national political scene. And it's a lot. It's a lot. Not to mention we've got this new financial game happening that nobody really seems to understand very well. That's not in investment themselves and finance themselves, which is why I had Barry Ritholtz on today, amongst other things. And so we talk about that coming up as well. But let me get it started. That's what you're here for, those conversations. Thanks to everybody who joined me last night. It was so great to see so many of your bright, smiling faces and meet new people. And we had a great conversation about what we've learned from the pandemic and what we've missed the most. And several people said hugs. A lot of us miss hugs. And I thought that was a really good point made by a couple of you. And then uh, our friend Kimberly uh, just talked about how much she loved watching Columbo. She'd never seen the show Columbo. And it's a great, great group of people from all over the country. Uh, Love, love talking to you guys. Had so much fun every Thursday night. All right, let's get to my first guest from The Hangout. She joined us last night. What you're about to hear happened in front of about 50 people. You hear a few other voices. Uh, My conversation with Liz Winstead, who is the co-creator of The Daily Show. She's a stand-up comedian who just put out another news special, which is fantastic. And... I invited her on because today she is holding an online rally, a virtual march, and I want you to go support her there and be a part of that. I'm going to try to jump in myself tomorrow, of course. It's the hashtag March for Actual Lives. Hashtag March for Actual Lives, and Liz talks about it. I've got links in the show notes. Uh, But here it is when Liz Winstead popped into our Zoom hangout last night of over 50 stand-up members, subscribers, and I hope that you'll join her tomorrow. And I'm sorry for using different tenses. I'm taping this on Thursday night, and the event takes place on Friday. Liz is here. I'm right here. Oh, my gosh. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for one of the most important people of all time uh, in my life and, and, and for certainly women's reproductive movement and comedy, the co-creator of The Daily Show, Liz Winstead, who I just, uh, more importantly, she's doing so much amazing work and activism. I just reached out to her right before and I said, could you please come by for two minutes just to, to plug uh, your work and what you're doing and what you want everybody here to join you in doing tomorrow. Hi, Liz. Hi. 
Thank you. I have my backdrop and you can sort of see it. There it is. You oh, see it a little yep. bit anyway? January 29, 2021, March for Actual Lies, hypocritesunmasked.com. What's going on? So I have been, for those of you that uh, don't know, uh, I do a lot of work and I started a nonprofit that focuses on reproductive rights uh, through a reproductive justice lens. And so we, one of the things we do is we have gathered this massive database of the intersections of anti-abortion extremism, white supremacy, you know, anti-immigration, just all the antis that are together. And I know you're going to be shocked to find out that the Venn diagram is like this. <laughs> There's, it's like everybody's in it, right? And so when the, when the insurrection happened in the Capitol, we had been tracking these anti-abortion folks and realized that so many of those same people were at the Capitol. And so we amassed this database and reported them to the FBI. But the thing that was sort of missing in this whole conversation was that three weeks after there was supposed to be a massive march in DC that happens every year with anti-abortion extremists mm -hmm. and nobody was talking about it. It's been on, you know, they got permits and the same folks at the Capitol, Trump loving anti-abortion, anti-government, anti-masking nut bars were going to convene in DC. So a bunch of organizations got together, worked really hard, uh, put pressure on uh, Congress, the Park mm -hmm. Services, everybody. And um, 10 days before the march was supposed to happen, they um, all of a sudden came out with a press release. It said, because of COVID, mm -hmm. we've decided to move our march virtually. And it was like, you know, COVID's been around for a minute. So <laughs> you were planning a march for 100,000 people to begin with. I feel like that's not real. But truth be told, they're going to spout their same lies and disingenuous conspiracy theories around reproductive health virtually than they would live. So tomorrow we have a big march planned online. If you go to the hashtag March for at 11 a.m. tomorrow on Twitter, uh, we have a rally. Uh, Jill Sobule singing. We have a conversation just around like what these extremes are. And then at noon, their virtual rally starts. And what we're doing is um, if you go to hypocritesunmasked.com, you can get a toolkit. We're fact checking their entire uh, program lineup. We have graphics. We have factoids. We have tweets. And we want to just take over their hashtag. And anytime they start spewing the stuff that is garbage, we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who have signed up to just retweet the facts that we're providing in the toolkits. And um, I think it's going to be pretty cool. And if you want to get your own personalized protest sign, you can get one. I can put in the chat. Are y'all in the chat? I can put the link in the chat. You want to do that? Perfect. That and I'll put it in tomorrow's podcast where I'll air this audio Great. as well. Um, so you can get a really cool frame. You can see all these other people who have done it. And um it's pretty, it's pretty great. So that's what's happening. Tomorrow in my when? Tomorrow, 11 a.m. Eastern on Twitter. Hashtag March for Actual Lives dot com. I mean, just March for Actual Lives. What am I saying? I'm so tired. Um, and then we're all gathering there. You can watch the rally. Then we'll head you over to where they're going to be broadcasting their stupid ass rally. And then we can take on everybody from horrible politicians to Tim Tebow, Tim Tebow weighing in. Is, is that on, right? Tim Tebow is going to be there. That actually, you know what? No one asked Tim Tebow oh my God. weigh in at all on my reproductive health. In fact, you're such a shitty baseball player. Why don't you go to the batting cages? You, I feel like that would be better. Tim Tebow. You're actually trolling around vaginas. No one asked him. That's not true. That's Is not he an avowed virgin? Tim He's Tebow. He's married. He has like a 75 children. I, <laughs> he was a terrible football player. A worst baseball player. Yeah. And a terrible vaginal crossing guard. He's bad at all of it. <laughs> <laughs> I actually asked Tim Tebow before I do anything morally. So it, I just, I don't, I don't agree with you on that. But all right, that's awesome. Yeah. That's tomorrow. And final question for you, Liz. I really appreciate you, you popping in here and bumping J. L. Covan because that's the story of his life. Um, but <laughs> we'll get back to you, Jeff. But uh, it's so great that he is our big star until fucking Liz showed up. And it's like so much. Much uh, applicable to his whole career. But Liz, how do you see the next <laughs> year or so 
in your fight with the Biden administration, but yet conservative judges and so on. Well, and conservative Biden, you know, here's the deal. We don't until we look at reproductive health rights and justice as a human right that we all fight for. It's just going to be saddled with the few of us that have dedicated our lives to it and thrust onto the people that provide the care to be defending it. And we just have to switch that out. We have to be bold. We have to talk about it in a way that makes sense. We have to center the people who are harmed the most, poor folks and people of color. And for God's sakes, we have to make sure that all pregnancy outcomes are valued so that if somebody decides they're going to have kids, those kids can be raised free from violence. Those kids can have money. They can live in worlds. Their sons and daughters don't have to worry about crappy ass cops shooting them because they live in the world. Like that's all part of the reproductive plan and reproductive justice plan that we need to fight for. And if somebody conversely says the way my life is now, maybe I have one or or more kids. I can't afford another one. I don't want another one. I never wanted them. We have to honor those choices too. But if you're going to coerce somebody's body and decide how their life needs to go, that's problematic. And, and passivity in being pro choice doesn't make change. You have to, you have to talk about it. You have to give abortion its moral place in the conversation around health. And that's what we need to do. And we need to push Biden there and we need to push uh, Congress there. And, uh, and all y'all who, you know, have thought about it as this ancillary thing, there needs to just be a little bit of a reset. So that's what I hope happens. HypocritesUnmasked.com, brought to you by Abortion Access Front, Liz Winstead, who also just mentioned, I, every time I talk to you, I always like to just mention your book, your memoir, Liz Free or Die, because that oh. book, I was always pro-choice. I didn't think that much about it. I was like, duh, kind of thing. Like, of course, I'm pro-choice, but I had never really talked to or, or heard about in, in, intimately what it's like to have to go through an abortion. And you write so poignantly about your own and your own life when you were, what, 16, 17 years old in Minnesota. And that book is still so valuable to me. And it has made the, the, the new bookcase here in the shed. It's up here. Wow. Yeah. I made the shed. You made the shed. It's a pretty big uh, thing I for your like career. I feel like a little bit like that's like a Ted Kaczynski fan, like <laughs> Ted Kaczynski at a book club. Yeah. Like, oh no, your God. book is right above a dismembered body. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. what is happening yeah, right? i don't know what to tell you uh, i mean i feel thrilled and honored and i um i like the pink lighting it kind of adds to the whole kaczynski vibe thank it feels you. a little bit like you're in like a disco that might have some questionable black light stains you, i don't know, you know, I, you know I can't doesn't imagine it, doesn't the pink just have a little bit of you know like what? You know what wow. else? Adds? See a little yeah, bit of. A little bit of seems a to be a smudge, you know, right? Too. Yeah, did, yeah. Did you Vaseline that. You that, know what uh, else adds to the vibe? Um, this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's more of an eight millimeter vibe. <laughs> <laughs> Liz Winstead, give her a round of applause. Liz, thank you for stopping oh, in. Get some rest. I was so glad to come Big and day see tomorrow. Y'all. Big day tomorrow. Thanks. Please join her. Please join her tomorrow. Come thank you. Yeah, go when you hang up. Go get one of these dope frames. You can pick all the ones that are surrounding me. They're really great. You don't have to make them your profile picture. You just get sent to a wall full of really cool people who have said, I'm just going to put my face on this issue and care about it. And you get to pick from all kinds of things. So go do it. Be part of the fun. Thank you very much. See you tomorrow. Thank you for leading. Thank you for being here, Les. Really yeah. appreciate it. Bye, yeah. guys. Thanks, Liz. See you later. Uh, Thank you. Quickly, back to jail. How does it feel to get bumped uh, Where you when you were the headliner? <laughs> well, no, I just uh, I, I think uh, I'm waiting for the GOP to start referring to abortion as cancel culture. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about cancel culture in general? What do you think about that phrase? You're a uh, you're half Haitian. Well, sure. I don't know what that has to do with anything. But well, what I feel, I, I'll <laughs> tell you what it has to do with. I feel like people of color don't talk about cancel culture that much. I don't really hear a lot of, but maybe I'm wrong. Go ahead. No, I, I uh, the Stupid. joke I told, which is a true story about this, is my fa- my uncle, um, when I was five, I had heard the song Karma Chameleon by Boy George and Culture Club. And uh, I said, could you get me that album for my birthday? Not really understanding anything about I just thought the song was good. And when uh, my uncle showed up to my fifth birthday with a culture club record for me as my present, my uh, Haitian father, born in 1931 in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, as I always say, 
not a bastion of pro- progressive parenting. Uh, it was a big argument about how he wanted that returned. And I said, my father was part of cancel culture club. <laughs> Yowza. <laughs> Boy, George, was no. that a bad joke? <laughs> Boy, George, was that a bad joke? That's good. <laughs> All right, a little sample from last night's Zoom Hangout every Thursday at 8 p.m. Stand up community subscriber members join. We hang out. We bring people in, special guests, and vitamin. Great to have Liz Winstead pop in. And then you heard J.L. Covan at the end there. But, of course, if you're listening to this on Friday morning, there's a big anti-abortion march. And so as a reaction, of course, Liz's group is uh, at Abortion Access Front, at Abortion Front on Twitter, and definitely sign up to join them. Hashtag March for Actual Lives. You can check my Twitter handle for more. I created the little frame that she was talking about, but really important, great organization, and an awesome leader, and very smart, funny woman, Liz Winstead. Also great to have J.L. Covan stopping by. And speaking of comedians, Thoughtful folks. Christian Finnegan is here. It's Finnegan Fridays, everybody. Christian joins me pretty much every Friday to wrap up the week and talk about a couple of other issues. We started our conversation talking about some TV film stuff and then got to politics, COVID, and the week that was. Here's my latest conversation with comedian Christian Finnegan, who you can follow on Twitter at Christ Finnegan. And by all of his comedy albums, all the links in the show notes. Here it is. Finnegan Fridays, everybody. Hooray. Happy to see you and to talk to you and ask you about how you feel about things from this week and culture in general. First of all, um, you're it was fu- weird that you actually wrote that copy out, that weird sentence. I'm happy to <laughs> talk to you about things that happen. <laughs> I have a teleprompter uh, app that I use for to execute. Peggy Noonan wrote that for you. If I'm not uh, <laughs> James Baldwin wrote that for me. Um, so you say this a lot and I give you more respect on on all cultural criticism like music and art i think you do a really good job at that but you often will say a thing is bad but that you'll watch it and i like yeah, that good garbage yeah okay so could we just so you tweeted this week about uh the the show bridgerton my yeah. wife and my daughters loved it uh but they also love disney musicals so i don't mean to insult my family but you basically said it's <laughs> it's bad but you can't stop watching it right what what, what is yeah, that I, I mean it's it's not that different than than talking about mcdonald's food or you know uh, sure. uh snickers bars or whatever point. it's like i know that this is hot garbage but i will eat all of it um i mean yeah bridgerton is uh is silly Mm-hmm. It's for for people who found uh, Outlander or uh, Downton Abbey too intellectual. Um, <laughs> it's I get it. I get why it's popular. And like I said, I will continue to wa- watch every episode they ever make, probably because it's beautiful to look at. And it it feels it's not taxing <laughs> intellectually like you can check your email while it's on. OK, yeah. It's not like, you know, Breaking Bad where you're riveted by what's going on on the screen, at least for, for me. The, all that being said, and I like that you brought it in the food realm. That's a perfect uh, analogy. But but also you said this week that wo- the, the new Wonder Woman, the Wonder Woman sequel is is just very, very bad. Oh, wow. And, yeah. And I've, I haven't heard anybody say anything even remotely good about it. And I and I took the girls to see Val and I took the girls to see the first one. Mm-hmm. In the theater, and I absolutely loved it. And I did I, too. I, I, so many things about it. And in um, the, I interviewed the director, um, Patty Jenkins. Is that right, mm-hmm. Patty Jenkins? Uh, did, yes. Did she direct this one as well? Yeah. That's so my so question. Yeah. So my it. question is to you: Like, it, it, is this happen sometimes when the first film is great and the sequel is very, very bad? Is that? It, I mean, I can't think of those. You probably can't off the top of your head, but. It just seems like how could this movie with such a great premise and history and 
and, and screenplay and the first one be so good, be so bad. I have a hard time believing that it's so bad, but I, I trust you and everybody else. That, well, that's why, that's why I'm so fascinated by it because if it was just a bad movie, mm-hmm. it would be, I wouldn't really think much about it, but I've thought about this movie for a week solid now, just about how, why did they make this decision? And, you know, um, it's the story it's, is bad. Is that what you're saying? Is the story. I mean, the story is bad, mm-hmm. but also it's just overblown. It's two and a half hours long, and it doesn't. It's both juvenile and confusing, which is a weird combination. Mm. Um, I think that they wanted to go because it was set in the '80s. I think they wanted to go for something very sort of day glow, you know, really bright colors and kind of silly and not so heavy. I think they wanted to go in the opposite direction. A lot of the DC superhero movies, those Zack Snyder movies, are like absurdly dark, right? A lot of brooding and slow motion and all. And I think they wanted to go really just goofy and positive with it. But it it's just it's like a bad. Do you know what do you know what I mean by a baddie? No. Like uh, you know, when I was uh, you know like like the kind of movie they would show on MST three thousand or something like that. Like it's like a it's it's a movie that's like absurdly bad. That you know there's just bad performances and bad dialogue that you would laugh at with your friends. But it's like two hundred million dollar bad movie. Usually, usually when a movie right usually when a movie's that expensive. It, it it might be dumb, but it's usually competently produced. Hmm. Whereas I, I, it's hard to get into for people who haven't seen it without, uh, you know, there's just moments. Um, it, it's hard to explain, explain out of context, but it's just, first of all, Diana Prince, the character, mm-hmm. uh, wonder, AKA wonder woman um, is just a real fucking drip of a character which you know i think it totally worked in the first one because there's that fish out of water element that she's like pure and honest and open and genuine and she's introduced to the modern world and is kind of blown away by yeah. by all of those things whereas in this one she's been living in the in the world now for 50 60 years however long it's been and she just kind of comes across like like a mean girl from high school like she comes across like like the nice popular girl you know how there's like the pack of popular girls or popular guys in your high school. And one of them would be like, you know, would wave. Hello. They still hung out with all the dickheads and wouldn't step in. If, <laughs> if somebody was giving you a yeah, I think my younger daughter is that girl <laughs> I'm positive of it. As a matter of yeah. fact, she like treats everybody well, but hangs out with a lot of dicks. Um, mm-hmm. So let me ask you about another kind of cultural question, which is I, I, um, I'm, I'm interested in your response to, you know, one of the things that has been fascinating to just watch people's moral behavior through COVID in, in terms of, you know, what sacrifices you're going to make um, that you're clearly going to, you know, lose money on and so on. But it's the right thing to do. And maybe it's also, you know, the right thing publicly to do. It's good for your brand. And overwhelmingly, artists have not been touring and performing and attracting an audience. And obviously several, you know, different kinds of musicians, bands and comedians could easily pack out a theater or a place if it were legal because their fans would come and, and, and pay and, and join them. And that's been the case. I haven't paid attention as I normally don't to, to music, but it's been the case with, with comedians. And this week, uh, we, we learned that Dave Chappelle contracted COVID and there was a picture of him with several other comedians, Joe Rogan and others, uh, Michelle Wolf. And, and I wonder what you thought. I mean, you, your, your wife owns QED, this comedy club, and, and you guys have had to go by obviously a certain set of, of legal rules that you've pushed back against. And, and, and your wife has been really vocal on that in New York state. But I wonder about, you know, the fact that when Chappelle gets COVID because he's performing and they're you know, seen without the mask and stuff. What it, it, do you think that's, uh, is this a complicated issue right now in terms of performance and whether or not you should do it? Um, it's not complicated for me particularly. I mean, I, I think we all have to sort of find our own line and I understand why other people may, may feel differently than I do. There's a lot of comedians I know that just don't, wouldn't do live shows, period. No ands, ifs or buts. And I get that. And then there are comedians who will gladly do indoor shows and they're just just rolling the dice and they say, well, if I get it, I get it. You know, I'm in the middle. I feel then there's comedians like me who are like, I am perfectly happy to do outdoor shows that are properly distanced, Mm -hmm. but I'm not going to do an indoor show. And not even necessarily because I think that there's a risk of me getting it. If I do an indoor show, I I'm not, I don't like modeling that behavior for the audience. I don't want the audience 
to get, I don't, if somebody were to get sick and die, I don't want to feel any connection to that. I don't want to feel any blame for anybody. So a lot of it is just like, I don't want to feel guilty, Yeah, you know? Uh, so I don't know if that you, if you want to call that a high minded moral reason, or if it's, it's selfish in its own way, but I just have no interest in having that on my conscience. And, um, it, I, 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 I think a lot of comedians, there is this attitude, you know, that the thing that everybody's taking seriously, I don't take seriously. Mm. You know, there's that contrarian nature to being right. a comedian where it's right. like everyone who is like super serious about something, you kind of want to make fun of that. It's a perfectly natural impulse. And so I, or at the very least, there, there's kind of a, a cachet to just not giving a shit in general. It's just yeah. like, I'm yeah. just rolling through life. Cause I'm a comedian. I'm a wandering troubadour, you know, and my specifically dick about people's feelings, individuals yeah. <laughs> and not caring yes. about actual individuals in front of your face's feelings. And I've been guilty of that myself. So of course, I mean, we, I think I have it in me for sure. Dude, I was, on, I, I was on a zoom thing that thing you did it too. The, uh, the, the record breaking virtual comedy show that I, yeah. mm -hmm. and I did this, Dicky com comedy thing where uh, Mike Somerville, who I've always admired, liked and been friends with and I hadn't seen in a long time. He showed up. There were six of us there. And I started like making fun of how big his head and, and face are. And I talked about how <laughs> he must need like a king size sheet instead of a mask. And I was just making stupid big face jokes. And I made like three in a row. And the final one is like, man, I thought we I thought we liked each other. I thought we were friends. Like the last time I saw I saw you at Sirius XM, like you were really nice to me, and I was like, "Oh, but I, I thought we were both." I was just trying to be. Well, I was. <laughs> listen, it's. It, it, I, I was trying to be entertaining because we were on camera. Like yeah. I wouldn't have done that if it was just you and me. But we were on camera. We we're supposed to be being funny, and I don't have an act, and you have a big <laughs> face. But it, I did feel bad. I felt really bad. I was like, "Oh man, I didn't." I didn't mean to in any way <laughs> hurt your feelings, but I was a hundred percent took it maybe one joke too far and was just being, you know, it seemed dicky. So I, I just want to say I'm, I can be guilty of that criticism and I wanted to point to a, a one that happened just hours Dude, ago. Dude, I, I remember <laughs> the most embarrassing, one of the most embarrassing moments for me as, as a quote unquote professional comedian. That conversation you had with Ice Cube? Well, that's not even in the top 50, unfortunately. <laughs> um, I was hired... <laughs> to do the red carpet like backstage interviews at the jeff foxworthy roast oh, which wow. is probably around i don't know 2005 That's or awesome. something like that um and so i you know i was out in la and i was just interviewing the comedians before before the show and hey what are you gonna be talking about whatever and i was interviewing ron white mm -hmm. who i didn't know yeah. i'd never met before whatever but you know I'm a comedian. He's yeah. a comedian. Yeah. So I'm trying to, to be jocular, you know, I'm asking yeah, yeah. him questions, but he had, <laughs> he had grown out his hair. Cause I'd always thought of him as being kind of like a crew cut guy. I yeah. didn't, I later found out that he used to have like long, he ridiculously now, right long now hair. he has ridiculously long hair. Yeah. And yeah. I, I didn't know that. And yeah. so he had grown out his He's hair and a lot with of Chappelle like, and, uh, and uh, Joe Rogan. He was there. Go ahead. Sorry. I'm, I'm sure. No, uh, he had like a lot of styling product. Like his hair looked kind of like wet and tousled. And so I just, I didn't even mean to. I was just like, wow, working on kind of you changed your hair, didn't you? You got and he just started, and I could tell he was a little sensitive about it. And he just looked at me and he's like, Do we know each other? Right. Right. And I said, No. And he's like, oh, okay, because you're acting like we know each other. Right. And I just was right. like, Oh, I just yeah. melted yeah. like Pac-Man yeah. when he dies. Just like mirror. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I felt so embarrassed and guilty because he's 100 percent correct who the fuck am i to be busting his balls yeah. about something like that especially yep. on camera i don't and so you know but again i was doing that same thing he was like i'm trying to make funny moments for the camera you know and uh so uh, we all have to kind of ride that fader a well there bit. are rules you know if you know the person you could there there are no rules uh because there's this kind of mutual admiration or respect but if if you don't know the person it's like yeah who who, who are you uh, whether and sometimes you don't know where that line is until yeah. you cross it. Yeah. But I also feel like there are exceptions to that too. Like when people would come on my old show, like big name comedians, they would at least know who I was. They knew they were the, a guest on my show. And if they took a shot at me, I'd hit them back or I would sometimes open and they would fire back. And we knew what was happening, even though we didn't know each other. Cause there is that unspoken rule. Granted, it's a little bit different dynamic, than the one you're talking about. But still, like, I kind of feel like comics are supposed to know 
listen, we bust chops. That's what we do. And you're, you know, me making yeah, fun of your yeah, hair is Ron not. Ron White didn't even know me yeah. as a comic. I'm just some uh, fucking yeah, putz. Yeah, but you're there with a microphone on the right. He should have been listening to that. But no, I mean, I think you are particularly good at uh taking slams from comics like i think you enjoy it on some level like like oh i mean as long as this is yeah. great sl- yes for sure yeah. i like comedy like i like a joke and i certainly like i never want to be seen as not being able to be made fun of because that will prevent me from from making fun of you back a and b i'll just look like a, an insecure person like you have to be you have a certain comfort level and, and confidence level so that you can i mean i've always I, th- I feel like I've always been that way because I was a tiny kid. And I realized when people would make fun of me when I was really small, I had to take it in and not let them see me be affected by it or else they would be winning. Yeah. I mean, like the fact that, that you're bald, but you have a full beard. Like if I were to make some sort of joke that you look like one of those faces where you take the pencil and you draw the face that you used to get at the supermarket uh, <laughs> or that you look like you bought your beard at like uh, this, the Halloween aisle on CVS <laughs> uh, or something like that, you would take that in the right spirit. Well, tear, tears formed in one of my eyes. There's that, That's legitimately <laughs> true because I just got a compliment on the beard today from my daughter. And, and she's like, I like it much better this way. And then you just told me it looks like I purchased it. So it hurt a tiny bit. Well, I used to do a joke, and I don't think I ever put it on an album, but how I've always been weirded out by dudes who had full beards with no hair. Yeah, I am because too. It's Because con- it's the sideburns. Like, because yep. hair isn't meant to just start like sideburns are supposed to emerge from I hair. struggle with it because if you're bald and you have a beard, my head, it's contrived. It's fake. I know that you can keep growing hair there, but it stops and starts in kind of an artificial way. And you're you're clearly trying to create a jawline you don't have. And well, would you pick a line like where, where, they, where sure. you just like? For sure. uh, yep. Yeah. And so you shave upwards from that line. Yes, that's accurate. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I keep it it's level. Weird. That's weird. It is weird. It looks like some kind of a strap, <laughs> a, a chin strap to keep your your skull on in a way. And it mm-hmm. look, but it's better than the alternative. I, that that's the answer. I did grow well, my I, hair I out. I used to say that it was it is as if I shaved all of the all of my pubes above my penis, but then left like a big bushy underball fro. Right. That's like how it looks. Similar. Like to me. Similar. It's weird when I think adults, men especially, still refer to their. Uh, the hair in their pelvic area is pubes. It, I don't know pubes, what you. I yeah. don't know what you should call it, but it still sounds like we've reverted right back Pub, to pubic region, pubes, genital pubes. Mm-hmm. So let's move from pubes to uh, conspiracy theorists because this week, Christian uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene nice transition beca- thanks, became really famous uh, for those people who aren't necessarily you know paying real close attention to politics. She is a, a congresswoman from Georgia who was elected. Uh, she's a Q, a, a QAnon conspiracy theorist. She's uh, said all kinds of crazy things in the past, including someone should kill Nancy Pelosi, and you know certain shootings didn't happen. And all these videos emerged this week of her. Uh, harassing or or following uh, David Hogg and some of the other young activists, uh, gun control activists from the March for Our Lives organization, which came out of the Parkland shooting. And I have a weird opinion about this that I wanted you to shoot down or disabuse me of. If if you make yourself a public activist and you go on TV and you talk about an issue you care about, even if you're a minor, even if you're a teenager, you are putting yourself out there. Uh, to be ridiculed and to be criticized, and that that's part of it. Uh, I think it's different when you're a young person, but still you're putting yourself out there. And so in a weird kind of way, I think I might be defending her harassing him as he's up there on Capitol Hill trying to get congressmen to pass gun control laws. Like, that's her right. She's a despicable person for doing it, but he put himself out there, and I think that's kind of an important learn i think it's folks should know that that'll that that that's what happens and that's why a lot of people don't do anything and and put themselves out there why am i wrong well i don't i don't know that you're wrong uh i think that people should distinguish between behavior that should be technically allowed under the rule of law and behavior that disqualifies you from holding public office you know what I mean? That it's like, yes, of course she can do that. Of course she can do that. I mean, but you are a woman in your forties screaming at a teenager <laughs> who survived a, you know, a school shooting. Um, 
if that's how you would like to spend your time, uh, you know, I guess legally you are allowed. I mean, it, I, w- I would d- differentiate between her and, you know, we were talking off air and you were talking about how journalists approaching people on the street and how often that is needed and important and all that. She's just some ranting weirdo, just, you know, screaming, you know, like, uh, you know, confront me. And why won't you turn around? Why well, she's a pro you, gun you know, activist. He's an anti gun activist. If I wanted to water them down. Yeah. But I mean, there is such a thing as harassment yeah. and, uh, you know, uh, verbal, you know, assault, assault doesn't do, always have to do, be physical. And, um, but I'm saying, Set that aside. Let's say that you're 100 percent correct. And she what she is doing is legally allowable under law. I'm inclined to probably agree with you. I don't think that necessarily means that. I feel like there should be a higher standard for who should be able to hold the public trust than just not doing anything actionably actionable in a legal sense. You know what I mean? I feel like there should be some minimum there's got to be a group of people who aren't in jail, but aren't allowed to be congressmen either. <laughs> and she <laughs> no, the, the in threshold for sure. It disqualifies her that behavior. More importantly, the beliefs that she has and the things she's uh, been quoted as. And we've seen her saying it disqualifies her from being a congressperson. Uh, no doubt about it. But uh, in general, and that's a really good point. I mean, is there any difference between her harassing David Hogg and, and people harassing the young man? Uh, what's his name? The red hat kid, Sandman, maybe Covington Catholic Nick, Nicholas Sandman. Yeah. Is there yeah. you see that uh, the parallel there is that uh, they're both young kids. They're both I mean, ones of obviously more organized activist hog. Have I seen any adults stalking him on the street in you know, following him people confront him and talked about him. At him? Oh, right, right. Yeah. No, that's a good point. You're right. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know. I maybe that happened, but. I I doubt it, you know, and the sad thing is, you know, she won by like 50 points. Is that right? I think she ran not mm. I, I people have said she ran basically unopposed. And I assume what that means is that there was probably some token candidate, but it was like not a lot of effort. <laughs> she put did into have it. a decent primary uh, uh, opponent. And and that but that this brings us to the next question. Next subject is is the Overton window and the framing of what is far right, what is far left, what is centrist and all that. But more importantly, we often use the word extremist. A lot of folks use that word in media and in Congress to communicate about what someone believes. They, they have extremist views, beliefs. And I, I wonder how you look at that framing and, and, and that word. What's extremist on the right? What's extremist on the left? Because I feel like uh, language matters and the framing really matters as to what people believe um, yes. across the I mean, political there, spectrum. There's a lot of people out there who either get paid to or it's a part of their personal branding to complain that people on both sides are equally as bad. Um, and they always want to posit themselves as I'm the sane one and they're all crazy. You know, there are a lot of pundits and journalists to do that. And then there's just also people on social media who kind of have a fetish for framing it like that. And, uh, you know, there was the op-ed that came out this week about how, uh, I think it was Axios, uh, it's an article about how the, the, the sort of fire brands on both sides and it compared you know oh well on the right you have lauren bobert and marjorie taylor green but on the left you have the squad you know as if those two groups are equal you know Mm. as if people who are advocating for uh you know uh the green new deal are somehow analogous to someone who thinks nancy pelosi should be strung up by her neck until she's dead you know that those two things are somehow they're all crazy you know that is in in and of itself is a a uh an accelerant in my opinion to uh far right dangerous extremism yeah, it's a great Not point. Taking it seriously. That's the false equivalency thing is always really important for people to understand. I could talk about this one forever, but I mean, the, uh, you, the, the, the examples you used, or one side wants to create, you know, opportunities through government policy for education, employment, health care, et cetera. Uh, and you might not like that, but that's what they want to do. They want to pass laws and, and regulations that make that easier and, and, and better. And, but the other side, you use the example of wants to commit violence against people. But I would say the other side, their extremists uh, believe a lot of things that that aren't true and, and didn't happen. 
Like it's not a policy disagreement. They yeah. are they are now controlled. A lot of people are saying this. The future of the Republican Party is QAnon. They are controlled by conspiracy theories. So the extremism there isn't just that they want to commit violence. It's that, frankly, they want to commit violence uh, for, for reasons because they believe things that didn't happen, like the election was stolen. By the way, I'd want to commit violence, too. I've said this on the record. If, if the election was stolen, I get that impulse, but it wasn't. They don't believe in some of the most basic scientific uh, theories around vaccines and, and, and climate change. And so that's what I categorize as extremists. Not believing in science is my general. Well, go-to. Yeah, I, I would say that, you know, the the quote unquote radicals on the left they're not radical when you compare them to FDR and sort of uh, early 20th century in terms of how government, yeah, they're wrong. You know, yeah. they're, not, they're not radical compared to uh, Emma Goldman, you know, and people like that. But um, <laughs> they, even if you do consider that radical, it is radical policy. It's not radical behavior. You know, the, the people on the right who are radical, you're talking about actual radical behavior and personalities, radical personalities and radical uh, ways of interacting with your your fellow American. That's very different than 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 having a policy uh, proposal that is slightly outside the current mainstream view. Um, you know, I, I it's it's just it's this weird fetish that a lot of these places like Axios have that it's like they're so afraid of seeming biased that they will just bend themselves into pretzels trying to uh to claim that everybody is crazy on all sides and i'm the only one who's normal but there are this is something i learned early on who, who janine garofalo said this to me i'll never forget it sorry for the name drop but she said to me loudly several times there are not two sides to every issue there aren't yeah. we should we should not act like there are and 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 sometimes you know uh, we need to just acknowledge that, acknowledge that, and so this kind of false equivalency and 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 you know not wanting to be perceived as biased. You 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 said it well, but the other thing, uh, well, that- I, nobody ever makes those people define their terms. That we we always mm-hmm. allow them to sort of rail against what they perceive to be you know uh, malfeasance by the Democrats or whatever. But we never ask them to define what these terms mean. Like I remember during right. the. Um, you know, the run up to the first impeachment uh, where people were talking about no collusion, no collusion. You know, uh, I always wanted to I always wish someone would have asked one of these Republicans, like, do you believe that such a thing as collusion exists or pick pick your word? But let's just use collusion. Like, do you believe that that is something that a president can be guilty of theoretically? Mm. And I think the answer would have to be, well, sure. And I'd be like, OK, well, what would that look like? Well, Give me an yeah. example of right. what collusion would right. be. Right. You know, and nobody will ever go that far because especially with Trump, because they knew that eventually he would end up doing what they said. You know, he would eventually cross that red line. But but we we keep letting people on the right get away with never really saying ahead of time. What the immutable truth is like, can can we agree that today is Wednesday? Can we agree? You know, it's technically it's Thursday, but can we at least agree on that? Can we start from there? Yes. Do we agree that? Uh, the sky is blue. Well, I okay, like, great. let's I, move from there. You use the example of collusion. I like that same thought exercise to talk about in general, talk about corruption. What do you think is corruption? What's what, who is yeah, a corrupt give me business an person? Corruption. Who's a corrupt business person? Who's a corrupt politician? What is the thing that they do? For example, do you think it would be corrupting to appoint your son or daughter to a high level job in your government? <laughs> would yeah. that be an example? Uh, what did you did you pile on the criticism of The New York Times this week asking uh, another article or two about how uh, Trump voters are feeling? I mean, to me, it's just such it's such a fucking farce. It's so uh, it's so indicative to me of that. The Times. Are completely oblivious to what these people think, and so they assume we're all oblivious too. like we don't know anybody who's a Trump supporter because they don't know anybody who's a Trump supporter. And so they treat them like this rare exotic animal that they have to, you know, like it's a, you know, like a unicorn. It's like, let's, let's go see if we can find one of these unicorns and find out what they're all about. And we're like, bitch, I live next door to a unicorn. <laughs> like we're around, <laughs> around unicorns. I, I always say I myself, I grew up there. I grew up in upstate New York. Like yeah. I get it. They're yeah, in my like family. We don't know, they, like yeah. we don't know these people yeah. just cause you grew up 
you know, in a journalism family, you know, and your dad was a, a, law, a high price lawyer and your mother was, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, rich, you know, was a finance person or something, Goldman Sachs. And or just because you grew up in this weird bubble where you don't know Trump supporters, <laughs> that doesn't mean the rest of us did. And I grew up in suburban Massachusetts, which is like the most sort of classic Democratic uh, area of the country. I knew plenty of people yep. who I know for a fact and would guess are now Trump supporters, like yeah. some that I know for a fact and some that I just assume, you know, it's not a mystery to the rest of us. And so it's just them, you know, staring into their own belly buttons and being fascinated by the lint that they can pull out. <laughs> uh, final question for you. How do you think any any reactions to Biden's first full week in office, <laughs> his press secretary, any of the moves, announcements that he's made? Because I'm both on 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 racial justice and climate justice, I think, uh, at least the announcements that he's made, you know, executive orders that he signed, I think are following through with the rhetoric that he campaigned on. We'll see if they can pass actual policy. And obviously the big question about the Senate and what happens there. But what are your, what are your thoughts on this first full week of the Biden administration and the people that are working there? I've been, I've been super impressed so far. I mean, it's, it's only a week and I'm, I'm, I've been as impressed by Biden's administration as I've been depressed by the way the media has reacted this first week. Oh, How they've just yeah. immediately yeah. fallen into the like, oh, yeah. I thought you were all for unity. What's with these executive orders? You know, it, it just, it's so, you know, absurd. You cannot have because- unity until they recognize the outcome of the election. That's it. You don't blame any yes. Democrat. Why is everyone constantly asking Biden and Jen Psaki and all these people, why are they constantly asking yeah. them about the unity thing? There can be no unity until every single Republican elected official says in front of a camera, there was no election interference. Biden got more votes. And if they don't believe that, if they genuinely don't believe that, well, then you can't unify with those people. Right. You cannot unify with exactly. Madison Cawford. You know, you cannot unify with Marjorie Taylor Greene. And and what I wish people would 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 focus on is unifying with the the stated desires of the American electorate, not with the Republican elected officials who gives to Fox whether Republican elected officials go along with it. There are so many things that Biden has proposed that have vast majorities of public approval. Yeah. Now, if it was attached to a Democrat's name, maybe it wouldn't get that same level of approval. But if you ask people, do you believe in a $15 minimum wage? Uh, You know, like what happened in Florida? It's like uh, Florida, which has been trending Republican for a couple of cycles now when they put uh, giving ex felons the the right to vote again, it passed by, you know, uh, what's what's the word? Um, An overwhelming majority. Yeah, no, uh, ballot initiative. Oh, Um, oh, it was a referendum. Yeah. Yeah. Referendum. And so focus on unifying America that way. Yeah. Find these issues that Americans writ large say they agree on gun control, marijuana, you know, certain environmental things is a great point. Yeah. And uh, and uh, let and let fucking Kevin McCarthy and mm -hmm. Ted Cruz cry their crocodile tears about lack of unity on Fox. Who gives a shit? Great points, great analysis, great commentary, great analogies, as always. I love talking to you about this stuff, and uh, I appreciate you joining me, as always, buddy. Thanks, Thank dude. you so much, Christian Finnegan. I appreciate it, buddy. Talk to you soon. Christian Finnegan, everybody. Thank you, Christian. Go follow him on Twitter at Christ Finnegan. Tell him you heard him here and that you enjoy having him on Fridays. Always love your comments, feedback, as always, on each guest in each episode. So send it along to me, StandUpWithPete at gmail.com. And remember, our sponsor for this show is GiveWell. GiveWell.org slash standup is the link I want you to click. And I want you to sign up for a recurring donation to give well this month you can sign up for a recurring donation and you can save and improve lives the most each and every month it's an amazing feeling it's an amazing organization i love working with them they use a tremendous amount of research and scientific evidence to evaluate the charities that save and improve lives the most please go check out give well give well.org slash stand up select podcast and stand up with Pete Dominic so that we get credit and sign up right now for a recurring donation because there is so much of a difference you can make right now. So please sign up 
for GiveWell. GiveWell.org slash stand up recurring donation. Make it happen. All right. And finally, today and this week, final guest of the week is Barry Ritholtz at Ritholtz on Twitter. Of course, Barry has an amazing blog called The Big Picture. He has a podcast on Bloomberg's network called Masters in Business. You can sign up for his daily reads, which I love. And of course, he's the co-founder and chairman and chief investment officer of Ritholtz Wealth Management. Lots to talk about with Barry Ritholtz. And we actually had a longer conversation and um, I'm going to bring I'm going to put that next week and share the video for subscribers. But I reached out and had an addendum to the conversation, which is what this is after all of this crazy news broke about the GameStop short selling, Robin Hood app rigging, crazy situation that everybody is trying to figure out. So if this is something that you care about and are interested in, it's always something I want to talk with experts about and no one's better than Ritholtz, and there's a lot of different points of view on this, but here's my conversation about it all with the great Barry Ritholtz right now. Hello. Hey, now. Hey, now. Thank you. Thank you for coming back on. No, no problem. I, I mean, we should really do it wearing the same clothes, but you do an audio only, so it doesn't matter. Yeah. No. I, I, maybe I can make this a video. I mean, I'm wearing my NASA shirt. I'm wearing my Aspen shirt. I mean, we look That's like funny. it's T-shirt Thursday. I hope you guys got your T-shirt on. Red Holtz and I are wearing, uh, you got a NASA T-shirt on. I've got a an Aspen T-shirt on, and it means that our homes are warm. Right. A, a lot of people don't know my that shed. I'm a former engineer who helped uh, helped arrange the landing on the moon. Oh. Neil Armstrong, that was me. I didn't. I had no idea. Maybe we should talk about that instead of this right. GameStop thing. I, I called you I, back for. Actually, I remember being walked into the auditorium to watch that on a TV. They rolled out when when was that? Sixty seven or sixty nine? It was. I, I, I don't know. I had to be. Uh, I heart you know, Eight, seven, eight years old. Something wow. crazy. I remember because today is the day the Challenger exploded. That's the NASA yeah. event I remember most. Anyway, I thought that's why you were wearing the shirt. No, just a random coincidence. Top of the pile. All right. So I had to call you back. Yeah, 69. I got that right. Yeah, that's when it was. I won't take up too much of your time because I'm not sure even when you explain it, I'll understand and people will understand uh, what is going on with Reddit and GameStop and short selling and Robin Hood and what the ethics and the legality are of it. We touched on it yesterday, but I had no idea how big a deal this is going to blow up into, but a lot of experts are talking about this being a pretty rare and wild phenomenon. How do, where do we start? How do we explain it? Red Holtz, where are you on it? Yes. Yeah, so, what the fuck so is a short squeeze? This is, this is made for television bullshit. It really is hmm? in the, in the grand scheme of things. This is not a big deal. It's, it's certainly not a systemic risk the way the 0809 crisis was, where it froze so many avenues of finance that the entire economy um, ground to a halt. This is a bunch of bored people at home speculating. Um, they identified a glitch in the matrix where, it, where if you could find a bunch of people who had a large short interest in a given stock. And it's easy enough to do that with technology today. Show me the highest short interest. And you could target those biggest positions by buying a whole bunch of that by purchasing options. It's called a gamma squeeze to get mm. technical. Um, so hypothetically a stock is 20 bucks and you buy out of the money call options uh, so you buy the $30 uh, call options, which are don't have any value until it gives you the right to buy the stock at 30. And because these are relatively thinly traded stocks, the option traders who sold you that, they then have to go out and buy some stock here to hedge their position. If you do that with enough of it, you can move the stock. And basically, 
Um, this goes back to August when the CEO of Chewy.com said, hey, you know, Game GameStop is uh, needs to become more virtual. They don't need 5,000 stores and malls. If they were to become virtual, they could really be a substantial. I mean, they sell $5 billion worth of video games a year. It's not like they're, you know, not doing anything. And so that's what started in August when the stock was three or four dollars. That's Ryan and, Cohen, the co-founder of yeah. uh, the pet e-commerce company, but also your, your pal from the big short, Michael Burry, also right. uh, revealed that he had a position in GameStop, which apparently inspired confidence. So you get these yeah. two uh, credible guys talking about this company, and then you bring in Reddit as a platform and, and retail traders, which are different than day traders or institutional no, traders. I mean, they're essentially traders. So, well, they're so different than institutional things. traders. So, so first the, the quote unquote credible guys, the chewy CEO, mm-hmm. Burry, uh, they want to see the stock go from four to eight to 10 to 12. You know, you triple your money in a year. That's fantastic. The, the day traders, the Redditors, the Robin Hooders, the TikTok stock traders, uh, these people are stuck home. They're bored. They're, they're, you know, under pandemic circumstances, they can't go to concerts. They're not going to live sports. This has become entertainment. Right. And so uh, when you look at the volume of how much this traded, you know, $20 billion yesterday, that's not Robin Hooders. That's not day traders. That's some serious weight. And, and that means some big institutions are behind it. P.S. Um, Art Cashin, legendary floor broker who's a regular on CNBC and elsewhere, uh, said, hey, don't be surprised to see that some of these guys pretending to be mom and pops on these hmm. either Reddit message boards or, or or some of these other places, TikTok, are actually institutions just, you know, or, or, or large individual hedge funds on that side of the trade. When, when something is moving When there's momentum, people jump on it. Now, here's the problem. Robinhood is a fantastic, fun, um, algorithm-driven app that, you know, fills you with all this exciting dopamine hits on on buying and selling stocks, but it's free. And, And the problem with free is they're making money somewhere, and that means buried in the small print are ways that you eventually get screwed. I'm a fan of saying... Cheap is great, but free is problematic. Free well, means they're making money some other way. And whether that's selling your order flow elsewhere, charging, you know, they're not charging you a commission, but you're maybe you're not getting the best price. Or as we saw today, hey, there's a lot of risk in our clients buying and selling this stuff. And we don't want to take the risk of someone failing to make payments on a thousand shares of a $500 stock. That's that happens. Fi- uh, it theoretically could happen. So what ends up happening is they say, um, Hey, we're halting trading in this. Nobody could buy anymore. You could liquidate what you want. And so suddenly if you only have a Robin hood account, you're kind of fucked. A ro- just and explain that. Losing their minds over just it, re- but explain they're not that. a great broker. They're a, they're an app who has gamified trading. What a surprise that the gamification of day trading yeah. turns out to eventually blow up. Uh, what, what do you think of Josh Barrow's tweet? I know people think this is fun, but why do we have a stock market? So productive firms can raise capital to do useful things. Detaching stock price from fundamental value, GameStop is now worth almost as much as Best Buy, makes the markets serve the real economy worse. It's artificial. It's asterisk. So yes and no, he's right. But the problem is it's not a binary choice. It's, Mm. you know, it's, it's there, there are shades of gray. When I remember recommending Apple back in like Oh three Oh four, cause the white earbuds from that newfangled iPod started popping up on the subway everywhere. And it's like, Oh, these guys have a hit and this will help them sell computers. Mm. And the, I think the stock was 15 with $13 in cash. And that was like 20 splits ago. So, so at the time, everybody said, this is crazy. They're, they're losing to Microsoft. It's a failure. There's a fine line between a turnaround story. I mean, what about Tesla? Is Tesla really worth, 
you know, some people are saying it's worth two trillion dollars. It's five hundred or six hundred or eight hundred billion now. Where do you draw the line that hey, this will never be worth what people are believe it'll be worth? To well, maybe, but you know, I don't want to bet against it, so I'm going to get a. The the problem is either the market freely trades and people are free to lose their life savings because they're not smart, or we're going to put like there should be some legitimate bumpers. There should be some rules. And for example, you probably shouldn't should have to put up more money uh, to buy the stock. You shouldn't be able to borrow right to buy this because right. if you borrow a hundred thousand dollars to buy this at five hundred and it's two fifty, you've now lost all your money. Right. So they could do credible, legitimate things, but when it comes to putting a value on on stocks, this isn't a bug in the system. This is a feature in the system. Right. The inherent nature of crazy human beings buying and selling stocks means that there are occasions when stocks become insanely cheap that make no sense. And there are other occasions when stocks become really expensive. And I'll, I, I give you a million war stories that, that make no sense. There, there was this small um, telecom company that the biggest owner was a telecom uh, mutual fund. Uh, and that was like a big giant one from Fidelity or, or Schwab or one of the giants. I don't remember which it was. And management had decided that they're going to sell, they're going to merge this fund with the much bigger tech fund. And so this small, um, I can't remember the name of it, telecom company was the biggest position in the fund. And the fund just, you know, the new man manager of the joint fund didn't want any of it. So they just started liquidating. And this thing falls from like $120 to $60, to $20, to $10. I spoke to a buddy who was a telecom analyst, and I'm like, this thing can't be worthless, can it? $5, $4, $3. And I'm looking at it, it's got a book value of $10, meaning if they liquidated everything at auction, they would get $10 a share. It falls to $1.40. I could not get anybody to buy it because they just thought this is going into business. P.S., a year later, they get bought by Verizon or somebody for $14 a share. Wow. So the market is crazy irrational at times. And it's hard to say to regulators, you insert your judgment for when something's fallen too far or risen too, too high. If people are going to speculate, if people are going to gamble, they're free to lose their life savings. Nobody stops people on the way into a casino and don't. Don't mistake this. This sort of stuff has all sorts of elements of casino yeah, gambling. Yeah, no doubt about it. And says, okay, so show me your credit. Show me your, your household expenses and what you earn before I'm going to let you in here and gamble money you is can't there afford any way, to lose. Is, is there any way to, uh, I mean, short shorting a, a stock is, is, is a new tactic and technique in, in, in the markets over the past. I mean, not that new, but no, it's been around forever. It's new amongst day traders. It's new amongst other it's people. Been, it's been around for like these guys were on the other side. These guys, it were seems buyers. unethical to root against a company. It doesn't seem purposeful to have uh, um, investors rooting against a company. It would manipulate. It manipulates everything. I feel like short selling so, is, so is the unethical. counter to that is simply, the short sellers are the one who uncovered the frauds at WorldCom, at Enron, at go down the list. Lehman Brothers, so that, that, AIG, short serve a purpose because you, you, know, you can't just have relentless cheerleading taking stocks up and up and up forever. Occasionally, people need a dose of skepticism and humans some get caught up in the moment but that'd be like saying that, that gamblers staying in the hotel found out that they were you know the water was poisoned or that you know they weren't they not, weren't not really i mean I like mean, shouldn't there be that, government regulations that per, that prevent big companies that you just mentioned from from you know not covering th their asses and, and breaking the laws is, less, is barely a decade ago and they were engaging in a hundred billion dollar or fifty billion dollar fraud every quarter, moving liabilities off their balance sheet, making it look like a, I'm making it look like they were assets. It was called Repo 105. They would take liabilities, sell that obligation to somebody in what was purely a paper transaction, 
and and get get something on the other side. So the person involved had no true liability. They were just making a commission on the double transaction. But it magically made Lehman Brothers look fiscally sound. You and of course, want, Lehman Brothers went out of business after 150 years. So why are there not regulations on such things? But this you was wrote, going wrote, on for years until it was uncovered by short sellers. David should, Einhorn and others. Uh, all I'm saying is it shouldn't require investors to uncover a company's fraudulent activities. Who is better incentivized to discover that than investors? You, you certainly don't expect the DMV to find it. And the <laughs> SEC, I don't I want to say that the DMV, but their job is to ensure a level playing field. No insider trading, no cheating, no scams. But they're never, there's 3,000 publicly traded companies in the U.S. There used to be 6,000. Hmm. Um, uh, their job isn't to audit each of these companies and make sure. That's why there are accounting firms. And so forensic accountants sometimes double check the work of these accounting firms. And when they, the only reason you're going to get someone to put in a thousand hours going through some annual budget of a giant company is if they're incentivized to find fraud and pub publicize it. All right. To be clear, though, the short sellers are the ones that are getting screwed over on this deal because they were betting mm -hmm. against it. And you had a whole bunch of uh, every, they were wrong. You they overreached. They were wrong. Well, as soon as as soon as Chewy.com CEO and Michael Burry came in, it, l listen, I was short in heading into the financial crisis. I was short AIG. My firm was short Lehman Brothers. We were short CIT. I wish I made more money on the downside. I wish we were more short than we were. Bear Stearns was another one. And it's really hard to be short because the long-term tendency of the market is to go up. Short selling is a is very much a dying art. There are a handful of people who are very good at it. Most people are not. It's very, very challenging. Well, that said, you want these people out there looking to identify where companies are engaging in you know, bad behavior. Now you don't want these guys. It's called, it used to be called the bear raid. You don't want these guys basically making up stuff and attacking a company and driving its stock lower. And if it's not real, they have to really be finding fraud, but that's where the sec is supposed to step in and say, you're engaging in market manipulation. What you're doing is wrong. There was a period of time in the midst of the 08, 09 crisis where the sec, um, was seriously considering a permanent ban on short selling. It, it, it was one of the dumbest things hmm. I ever saw. The list of frauds uncovered by short sellers is all right. Well, you've, it, it's, it's I, giant. I can't, I can't argue with on that or anything else, but uh, what, what about just this Robin hood move? I mean, everybody seems outraged at this app that that is shutting down the ability to get out of the, the bet that you'd made, right? And the investment that you made. I mean, they're, they're not allowing you to do it. And I mean, I've been reading all kinds of- I think of they're letting you liquidate. They're not letting you add more to the position or what have you. What do you think of that? Um, you know- Are they entitled it, to do that? You, you choose your technology and trading partners carefully. You're, you're not just going to a supermarket and picking up a quart of milk- the trading <laughs> infrastructure that you use is really, really important. And Robinhood is free. And as I'm fond of saying, I, I sent you the column I wrote in, in 2018. Cheap is great, but beware of free. Because they are making money in all sorts of ways when it's free that that buried on page 37 of the of the you know fine print is we don't have an obligation to float you in the event that your purchases exceed um, our comfort level. We can force you to liquidate or put additional capital in or not grant you margin or even force you to liquidate if we think your trading is creating a risk to us, the company. Now, I haven't read the fine print at Robinhood, and I'm sure it's in you know unintelligible legalese, which by design is supposed to be unreadable. Um, but I would guess that somewhere in the terms of service, when you click install, yeah. you're agreeing to some bullshit forfeiture of rights that sets this set of circumstances up. This is the Dunning Kruger trade. This is people who don't understand that this is really complex. 
This isn't fun. This is serious business. And by not knowing all the minutia of what's going to happen, by not understanding exactly what the logistics and mechanics are behind your trade, hey, you're not paying. Uh, look, the whole industry has moved towards free, so it's become kind of an issue. You makes it even harder to do your homework right. to figure out what am I really getting? Right? Who is the brokerage firm behind this? Are they going to stand behind this? I mean, I I have seen stories of hedge funds with billions and billions of dollars getting into a similar tiff with their prime brokerage firm hmm. and basically saying, screw you, I'm going to take my $12 billion and go over there. And they're not happy to lose that, those, those clients, because if one guy leaves and is noisy and lets his fellow traders know, hey, these guys don't honor their quotes or whatever it happens to be, whatever the day argument is, they could see, you know, a healthy egress of capital. And so if I'm Robin Hood, I'm nervous about the liability I might have in terms of this trade going bad and me not collecting money for it. But if I'm them, I would also be nervous about a bunch of people saying, I'm going to be a serious trader and I'm going to find you know, a Fidelity or a Vanguard or a Schwab or a TD or some serious trading shop that will, you know, Scott trade and go down the list. There's, there's a dozen hardcore trading places that cater to people that swing a lot of money around rather than a gamified app that trading is almost secondary to what right. their business is. Right. Hey, the bottom line is you get what you pay for. Right, right. That's what I was going to. So, you were so I feel bad that there are people that are risking the rent money. I mean, here, here's the, the key takeaway. The, the narrative that this is the little guy sticking it to the man. I, I'm not really buying that. But but there is a subtext within this whole conversation that there are a lot of people who are rolling the dice. And Daddy needs a new pair of shoes. Yeah. Mommy needs to pay rent. And there are people who are literally at home, unemployed, not able to get a job in their field because of the pandemic, right. waiting on the next government check and saying, hey, let me throw a Hail Mary. And maybe if I make a little money with this, that's the problem is that you have this underclass of people who have become desperate, who have internet and bandwidth and enough cash that they can gamble, but not enough cash that they can lose. And those are the people who are really getting hurt here. Barry Redholtz at Redholtz. Thank you very much for that addendum. I hope I hope that explains it to some degree. As much as I can understand it. <laughs> All right, there you go. Big Barry Ritholtz at Ritholtz. Tell him you heard him here on the program, and that is it. That's all. Uh, zip it up and zip it out, folks. Friday, I hope that you have a great weekend. I hope that you'll check in on the Discord platform. If you get a lo lonely, which you have access to as a, as a member, subscribe to Stand Up right now. Go to patreon.com slash stand up because this show is free but not cheap. So sign up on Apple Podcasts at, for a subscription there. Just hit the subscribe link and leave a review and give five stars to the show because that does a lot, apparently. All right, out of time. Looking forward to next week where I'm planning as of now to make it climate week, maybe climate and comedian week. So one expert on environmental issues, climate crisis, and maybe a comedian for just a wider conversation. Maybe I'll do that next week. That's what I'm thinking about. But we'll see. I have a billion ideas in my head, and I so appreciate you supporting me. Now it's time to stop talking and let John Carroll take it away with his song written for the show, Stand Up.
And now, here is MSNBC's Mehdi Hassan summarizing almost every crazy, offensive, bigoted thing that Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene has said or done in under 60 seconds. Take it away, Mehdi. Marjorie Taylor Greene has been a supporter of Pizzagate, of Frazzle Drip, of QAnon, and has said she wants to take out the quote, global cabal of Satan-worshipping pedophiles. She suggested Nancy Pelosi should be executed for treason, and her Facebook page liked to comment about putting a bullet to the head of the House Speaker. She says Barack Obama used MS-13 to murder DNC staffer Seth Rich. She says Hillary Clinton used a kill list to order the murder of her political enemies. She called George Soros a Nazi and accused him of wanting to continue the Holocaust. She accused the Rothschilds of not just being part of a global pedophile conspiracy, but also the California wildfires. She thinks they may have been started by a laser beam from out of space. She shared a video accusing Zionist supremacists of conspiring to flood Europe with brown migrants to replace white natives. She denounced what she calls an Islamic invasion of Congress and tried to get Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib to swear their oaths on a Bible. She suggested people like them go back to the Middle East and stay with their goats. She claimed a plane never hit the Pentagon and 9-11 was an inside job. She thinks the Sandy Hook and Parkland school shootings were false flags. She even chased Parkland survivor David Hogg on the street while bragging about her gun. She thinks Donald Trump won the election and was robbed by mass voter fraud. In fact, she thinks Biden didn't win Georgia. He rigged it against Trump. But she won her seat in Georgia. It wasn't rigged against her. 